As the Spirit of God, we grant guidance and grace today, brothers and sisters. I like to talk and teach from this simple thought and theme, get uncomfortable. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, get uncomfortable. We oftentimes come to church and we hear the statement, get comfortable. But no, today I want to challenge you to get uncomfortable. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Oh God, do it again in Jesus' name. Amen. No person conscious can disagree that our world, our nation, is in the throes of cultural and even racial chaos and a state of crises. We live day by day and moment by moment in the sense of constant alarm and anxiety. In the span of a single week, we have witnessed again the senseless and shameful execution of precious innocent lives whose blood is yet crying aloud. After the celebration of Independence Day, we woke up to the report of another African-American man who'd been shot and killed by a police officer in Baton Rouge, Alton Sterling, AKA the CD man, was confronted by a police officer while selling his CDs. Shortly thereafter, a moment of exchange and conflict occurred to which he was aggressively forced to the ground, pinned by two officers who alleged that he possessed a firearm on his person. Seconds thereafter, one of the officers at close range shot him to death as he lay there in a pool of his own blood. A bystander, of course, captured the horrifying event via a cell phone, which has now circulated to well over millions of views on social media outlets and even the news media outlet. And many of us, with tears in our eyes and anxiety within our hearts, watched that video. And yet with the scene of Sterling having been freshly etched within our hearts and minds in less than 24 hours, another gruesome video went viral. Another individual right outside of St. Paul was again killed. The video first appeared on Facebook Live, capturing another young man, Philando, wearing a blood-stained shirt while in his car with his girlfriend and a four-year-old child, witnessing as she sat in the back seat the merciless shooting of this man. His girlfriend, of course, with her cell phone, recorded a portion of the experience, all while narrating what was occurring. They were pulled over because of traffic violation, namely a broken, better yet, an inoperative taillight acknowledging that he possessed a handgun and declaring as well that he possessed a concealed carry permit. He allegedly then complied to the officer as he went to present his permit, yet he was shot on the assumption that he was reaching for a gun, drenched in his own blood. That man, officer that is, stood with the gun still pointed towards him within the car, even with the child and girlfriend watching. If that was not enough, shortly thereafter, five police officers in Dallas were shot to death, sniper style, while seven were injured at an event organized to be a peaceful protest against police brutality. Young man, Johnson, Micah to be exact, was reported to be upset because of the fatal police shootings of Alton and Philando. And he decided that he would use white police officers as objects of target as he would now retaliate in executing and killing them. The videos of the death of these young men, of course, has provoked a cry of anger and grief and frustration and despair However, retaliating and killing white police officers, or others for that matter, does not solve the problem of police brutality. I concur with Dr. Martin Luther King as he states in The Strength of Love, and I quote, returning hate for hate, hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness 
to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. But yet the urgent question of the day is, well, what are we to do? The church, that is. What are we to do? Believers, that is. In particular, what are we to do? The black church. And please take that particular phraseology as design church that is predominantly made up of African Americans. What are we to do? The black church, representing as it does, a people who are still stereotyped, criminalized, killed by police, underrepresented in sites of power and overrepresented with respect to incarceration, drugs, and all other different type of criminal and crime activities. There must be a bridging of our theology and the elements and issues in sociology. There must be some, effort, some efforts of connecting spiritual edification with earthly empowerment. Somehow, in some way, the church and the city and community must have collaboration in addressing the social ills because it is really an issue that is of the heart. There's a heart issue that would cause a person to put a gun on an innocent bystander and shoot them. It's not an S-K-I-N issue. It's an S-I-N issue. And the church must be engaged in the cultural crises that we find ourselves in. The church cannot isolate herself to the pulpit or the pews, locking herself behind and within her spiritual castle while surrounded all about mounts, bodies, of dead African-American boys mingled by police bullets and white hatred and black apathy. We as pastors and we as congregants and believers throughout the U.S. must uphold the value that indeed, yes, black lives do matter. And I know some bourgeois upward mobile just left the country yesterday, all of a sudden got to the city, you now are offended by such an expression. Black lives matter. Yes, all lives matter, but black lives matter as well. That is not at the exclusion of other individuals, no different than the statement breast cancer matter. It does not downrate the reality of throat cancer, but it's placing effort, emphasis upon a particular issue. And our lives matter. Brothers and sisters, society has attempted to criminalize an entire race of people. Our spiritual beliefs, our church affiliation, our denomination offers us no protection from police brutality, inequalities, or injustices. We must stand up. Just as we did during the era of enslavement, we must stand be the radical moral conscience of our conscience like we were during the civil rights movement. We must stand. We must not be guilty of being disengaged in addressing the structures of race-based systematized injustices and inequalities. There must be a limiting in the pulpit, in the pews, and in the public square. We must, of course, applaud and appreciate those churches and leaders who are speaking against police brutality and incorporating it within their sermons and engaging in activism. But far too many of us are preaching the same old God will make a way somehow sermon and put on the whole armor while we are perched on the pew hiding behind the stained glass up under the steeple of the church. There must be engagement of the church. And I know some of you again, you argue from the perspective, but what is the model of the master. What do we see of Christ in scripture? The understanding of Christian theology indicates that the Christ in whom we serve was one who was engaged in the sufferings and the afflictions of people that abound. Jesus healed the sick. He cured the blind. He made the lame walk again. He fed the hungry. He educated the ignorant. He resurrected the dead. And these miracles point to the fact that Christ was not oblivious to the pains of people or the plights of humanity, but rather he was one who was touched with the feelings of the infirmities, so much so that he was meaningfully engaged 
in the process of healing. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s achieved almost unthinkable success in ending segregation in public facilities and overturning housing and employment discrimination and in turn changing what we thought could never be changed in America. But reforming police practices has not been codified in legislation and it continues with us today. We all deal with painful reminders of the unjustifiable death of so many unarmed African-American children, women, and even beyond that men, along with inexplicable grand jury inaction in many of the cases. No one indicted, no one brought to justice. It adds to this systemic over-policing and arresting and incarceration of African-Americans. And we see how pressing civil rights issues reformed police and criminal agendas then, and I believe even if we decide to be uncomfortable today, change can come. Do you understand that where we are as a people is as a result of our four parents who refuse to be comfortable? Whatever you do, do not become so upward mobile that you fail to appreciate our ancestors who were uncomfortable. Uncomfortable sitting in the back of a bus. Uncomfortable being regulated to a certain water faucet. Uncomfortable saying, being told that they cannot eat at certain tables. They got uncomfortable to the extent that they became proactive in addressing the social ills of society. And we ought to applaud this rising and emerging generation of millenniums who are chanting Black Lives Matter. We ought to appreciate them, but whatever you do, don't tell our communities. Whatever you do, don't get yourself caught up where you're locked up in jail. No, because the reality is simply this here. Your voice has become silent if you're doing destructive behavior that removes you from the context and the public square of conversation. So the question is, well, what shall we do? I believe Amos chapter 6 provides us some biblical insight as it relates to guidance of what church and the community of faith ought to consider doing. Let me offer some of the gleanings just from this morning because candidly I was planning to preach something else, but I couldn't rest without giving theological commentary to this issue. What are, we, what are we to do? What are we to do? The first thing the text is telling us to teach us, even as Amos is dealing with the nation of Israel and their debauchery, idolatry, immorality, and sinfulness that has all caused judgment of God to come. But there's principles that we see nestled in this text that really would help us and guide us. What are we to do? Here it is, number one. Resist the spirit of apathy. Let the church say resist the spirit of apathy. It's right there in verse number one. Listen to what Amos says. Woe unto them. He, he doesn't say it in some low key, soft tone. Woe unto them that are at ease. In Zion. That word at ease means who are comfortable. There's a moment to rest, but there's a moment to stand. An army that returns back from battle and stands in formation before sergeants. We hear such a comment at ease, which means rest, dismiss. It's a dangerous thing to be at ease when you're at war. And too many of us are walking around as if God has said at ease. He says, oh no, you're at war. And if indeed you're going to deal with the issues, you must resist the spirit of apathy. The spirit of apathy. I believe this text provides for us at least five ways we see apathy as it has now entrenched within the consciousness of the community of faith and even the context of the Christian 
structure. How? How do we see apathy? How do we see apathy? Here it is, five ways. Here it is, it's in the text. Number one, with flawed presumption. Look at verse number one. Woe unto them who are at ease where church in Zion because there was a flawed presumption. And here was the presumption that we're in Zion. Zion is the epic center of religious activities and spiritual happenings during biblical antiquity. Zion was the place where the house of David was located. Zion was the place where the temple of God was located. And so there is this flawed presumption that if we're in Zion, everything is fine. We have the same sort of attitude as it relates to church today. There are those of you that came to church today just with the agenda, I just want to have good church. I want the choir to sing. I want pastor to preach. Whatever he does, don't preach too long. I want to be able to have church and go out and enjoy life. Because there is this attitude that is pervasive within the church of this presumption that if we can just get to church, everything is fine. Contraire. This same place known as Zion was also a place that was ransacked by the enemy because no geographical location can provide for you complete security. Even Jerusalem walls fell and city was destroyed. Whatever you do, don't suffer from flawed presumption. You're presuming that just because you come to church, perch on a pew, hiding behind the stained glass, beneath the steeple, singing kumbaya, everything is fine. Contraire, whatever you do, soldier, you're not at ease. Flawed presumption, but here it is, followed up by false protection. It's right here in verse number one. Not only are they at ease in Zion with their flawed presumption, but they also have false protection who trust in the Mount of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. There is this attitude that Israel has that if we can just get to the elevated city of Samaria, elevated, not only elevated, but fortified. Its walls were fortified, and the enemy would have a difficult time infiltrating Samaria. And so the assumption of Israel was if we can somehow just get to Samaria, the enemy can't reach us. That's false protection. And there are those in this place today, you have been arrested with an attitude of apathy because you have assumed that you can find protection in certain places. Your protection is not in the Democrats. Your protection is not in the Republicans. Your protection is not in your financial accumulation, your political affiliation. Your protection is in God and God alone. <laughs> Furthermore, there's this attitude that if I can just get to a particular geographical location, I'm safe. That's again, the skewed mindset of the bourgeois, new Negro, <laughs> who's under the mindset that if I can just get to a certain subdivision, if, if I could just get from the inner city and go out to the suburbs, if I could just find a condo, if I could just find a gated community, I'm protected, no country. I don't care what code you put in the keypad. I don't care how many locks and bolts you still have on the door. We still live in a wicked and evil world. Because there are those of you, you don't mess around and believe because you live in a certain side of town and because you got a name associated with your community because you pay fees and you got a little security booth and a part-time security guard sitting, you think you got protection. The devil is a lie. Have you discovered that evil and wickedness does not abide by zoning regulations? Zip codes? But you think, well, that's just their problem in the inner city. That's just their problem in the other 
low-income cities. No, child, come on, for real? You think drugs is just something that happens off of Fulton Industrial? You got, here it is, you got the Fulton, Fulton Industrial crackhead, and you got the corporate American crackhead too. Corporate America, all they do is just put a tie on it, and they got a, a name on their desk and on their door, but still a crackhead is a crackhead is a crackhead. And I don't care where you go, there is no place you can go to find immunity from the reality of sin. It's everywhere, church, false protection, flawed presumption. But then there's this spirit of apathy that comes as a result of fatal procrastination. Look at, look at verse number three. I'm walking the text. And ye have put far away the evil day, and it's caused the seed of violence to come near. Here's what he's really saying. He says, you now think, ain't nothing going to happen no time soon. That the evil day is far gone. It's, it's n- n- nothing, I mean, just here it is. Here's, here's the mindset of some today. What has happened in Baton Rouge and happened Minnesota, here it is. I just isolated incidents. Ain't nothing really happening. Are you for real? Are you for real. Because here it is, here it is. You think that your yeah, evil may happen, but it's, it's really not going to happen anytime soon. That's something that's being exaggerated. It's always exaggerated until you get the call late at night that is your son, your nephew, your godchild. Then all of a sudden, oh, it's real. This false procrastination, that is nothing going to happen in a time soon. Also, here it is, fatal, fatal procrastination. Yeah, you got to do <laughs> fatal procrastination. Here it is, D. Look at the other issue. Frothy preoccupation. Look at the attitude. Look at the attitude, church. In verse number four, Zion, Israel, the people of God, he says in verse number four, you lie upon beds of ivory. You're so comfortable, you done stretched out on couches. You're eating your lamb chops. That's what it means, lamb out of the flocks. You're eating your filet mignon, your calves out the midst of the stall. You're sitting around listening to your music, just whining and dieting. Verse number six, you drinking your Merlot. Chardonnay. <laughs> That's what Ted said. You drinking your wine, not in cups, bowls. <laughs> Have anointed yourself with chief ornaments. So you walking around flashy. What is it on fleet? On fleet? Whatever. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I mean, you just, you got it going on. Here it is. And you're so preoccupied with yourself. Here's what he's saying. I just want to be comfortable. I'm comfortable on my bed. I'm comfortable on my couch. As long as I got something to eat, something to drink, as long as I have labels in the back of my shirt, I'm comfortable. He says, you become so comfortable that you have been arrested with an attitude of apathy because you're not concerned about nobody but you. As long as it's not your child, it's not your family member, as long as everything is copacetic with you, you're fine. He says, that's the problem. But here it is. I'm about finished, church. Your excitement is overwhelming. (laughs) Flawed presumption, false protection, fatal procrastination, frothy preoccupation, But here is the deadly one. Verse number six, the latter clause. But. He said, you're all comfortable, enjoying life, complacent, but they are not grieved. For the afflictions of Israel, you're not concerned about your descendants. Here's what he says. You have become anesthetized. 
Anybody been to the dentist any time recent? Had to have a procedure? And that nurse and that doctor came out with that syringe. Inside of that syringe, that needle, was medication to which they pierced your gum in different places within your mouth. And then all of a sudden, your mouth just went numb. They put on face mask, pulled down a helmet. You was able to tell this is a serious case. That big old thing over their face. And they got to drilling and picking and pulling and removing with the suction of blood just coming out. And you didn't feel a thing. Because you were numb. You was anesthetized. And if you witnessed last week and didn't shed one tear, you become numb. You have become anesthetized. If you got a child and you didn't go find that child and put your arms around that child, and pray God's protection over that son, that daughter, that granddaughter, that grandson. You become numb. Don't even grieve. Lord, help us today. The afflictions of our sons and daughters. Yesterday, CJ, who's about to walk out. <laughs> I was working on this sermon. He's actually doing social media. He does the social media. For me. I was working on this sermon. I had a totally different sermon done. More, I started listening to the news. I said, God, you got to speak. And I was in my office, just got off of a flight. Was at home five minutes, left out. I said, Clear, I gotta go to my office to work. Started working on this message. Didn't start connecting. I called CJ, I said, man, where are you located? I need to come talk to you real quick. And I went over and I sat down with my son. As soon as I walked in, he had this face and this look like, what did I do now? Nothing. <laughs> as sad as it is, I had to talk to him because just two weeks ago, he got his license. I said, CJ, I know we've had this conversation, but I got to have it with you again. Let me explain to you the protocols if you ever get pulled over. Let me explain what to do and what not to do. Because my heart grieves. Our boys and our girls whose lives are being innocently shot down. And if you can't grieve, if your heart is not hurting, you become too comfortable. You become You become too comfortable. But all you're going to do is tweet about what's happening and Facebook about what's happening, but not sit down with your kids. Come too, come too comfortable. And I want to see my son's kids. I really do. I want my son to get married. But he's growing up in the wild, wild west. And 
we can't sit down. I ain't done. Can't be comfortable. So, Pastor, what do we do? That's what I asked God. I said, you know, what, what do we, what do we do? It's as if I heard the voices of our ancestors saying, "Do what we did. Do what we we did." What is that? Because if we're going to deal with the crisis and chaos we're in, resist the spirit of apathy, recognize, I didn't even give you this point, the sinful atrocities. That's what he says in number two, verse number two. He says, go look at these different other places who thought that it never could happen to them and, and look at them now. Look at Hamath, look at Gath, look at Kaneel. He says, go, 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 go recognize the sinful atrocities because they thought they were better and it could never affect their borders. He says, go, go check it out. And let me contextualize and contemporize that verse for you, verse number two. Here's what God is saying to us. Go, go look at St. Paul, go look at Baton Rouge. Go look at Houston. Go look at Tennessee. He says, Atlanta, whatever you do, don't you get beyond yourself and you think it can't happen here. <laughs> and we must recognize the sinful atrocity. We got to be willing, here it is, to look at it. And identify it for what it is, sinful atrocity. And this is the sin of conservative evangelicalism. Here's the sin of the conservative wing of our church. Is that we have a hard time recognizing sinful atrocities. It's pretty sad that one of our conservative branches, even Southern Baptist Convention, there's no denying it, just a few years ago, not relatively long, just apologize for sanctioning slavery. And then some of us get beyond ourselves thinking, where to go? <sighs> the sinful atrocities. That there's still the attitude that whites can be trusted and blacks can be trusted. Sinful atrocity of racism, classism, sexism, all of the isms you can think of. And if we're ever gonna change anything in our world, we have to recognize the sinful atrocities and things that have happened in the past because what happened in the past can be repeated in our future. Resist the attitude of the spirit of apathy. Recognize the sinful atrocities so that here is what I want to, want to be here real quickly. So that we can respond strategically with activities. That, that's what we need to be. That's what we need to be. How do we respond? And this is when I had that conversation with our ancestors in my office. I heard their spirit speak to me. Do what? We did in the past. What is that? Here it is. Here it is. Here it is, church. Intercede. They were still away and they would pray. Because we're in a situation here at this church that we need heaven's help. We, 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 we really, we really need for real. I'm not talking about us just saying it, I, I mean us believing it. That we need heaven's help. We need prayer. Every man in this place, every man in this place, I want you to stand. Your man, are you happy? You know it. Stand. 
Just last Friday, Friday, 6 o'clock a.m., we had 188 men. <laughs> Friday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, 188 men. Bible study. That particular week was scheduled for my family vacation. That's the only reason I was not in attendance. I had 188 men, five, 6 o'clock in the morning, Bible study. And here's what I'm asking for today. It's 300 men. Just like Gideon had 300 for battle. That would come out this Friday morning for prayer. That, that's all I want us to do. Just, just come together in this sanctuary and pray. The three, 300, 300 men that would say for one hour. I'm willing to come and pray. Now, let, let, let me help you. Now, if you've got to go to work, that's, listen, don't feel guilt, don't feel pressure if you know you just can't do it. But if you know that all you really need is to make, make some adjustments like you do anything else you want to do, I'm asking that you make the adjustments and meet me here Friday, 6 o'clock in the morning as we pray. It's good to march, it's good to, to walk, it's good to chant Black Lives Matter, but we also got to pray. For if my people, which are called by my name to humble themselves, seek my face and pray, turn from their wicked ways, I hear from heaven. I forgive their sins, I heal their land. But that's predicated upon if you pray, if you seek, if you be humble. Now, I'm going to show you the one verse in this passage that would help you to come. Friday, 6 o'clock a.m. One verse. Hold what you have. Verse number four. This one verse to help you to get here. Get out of your bed of ivory. <laughs> and get off of your comfortable couch. Be willing to say, you know what? I, I, I really would prefer that one extra hour of sleep. But this is so critical, I want to come and do my part in praying. Take your seats, man. That's what our foreparents did. They, they prayed. Here it is, number two. Here it is, number two. Number two, invite. My plan, chief, within the next 30 days is to host a town hall meeting here at our church. Addressing violence to our people within our community. That we come together, 300 men, and within the next 30 days, 1,000 youth. When we come together and we share with them and we talk to them about how to navigate the choppy waters that they must sail through. It is a different day. Remember on, uh, what was that show? It's a different world. It's a different world. Here's the punchline than where we came from. And so within the next 30 days, a thousand young African-American boys convening in this sanctuary as we talk and share and give them guidance and direction. Simple things such as how do you handle interacting with the police? Amen. Removing the stereotype that every police is not bad. Oh, you couldn't say nothing right there. I know it's sensitive, but every police, let me, let me go even deeper. Every white police is not bad. Let me tell you, if someone was to break in my car, break in my house, I'm calling the police. I'm calling. I'm, I'm. And we got to help our young boys understand not every one of them are not bad. This whole attitude, kill the cops, kill the police, that's not a... Uh. We got to invite and sit down. And I thought about it. 
Chief, you may agree with me. You, you know just as well as I do. In less than probably a five-mile radius of this church, and I just know some of the people I just know, there's no less than about seven political officials that live within a five-mile radius. I'm just thinking about people I just know. Of. And I'd be doggone if you're just going to show up around this season when you need a vote to get into office. No, 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 no. Let's come and talk proactively and figure out collaboratively how do we come together and make things... Elizabeth, we're too great of a church not to put pressure on them. We're 17,000 voting folks. You want our vote? You need, you need to listen, listen to our voice. Thank you, Holy Ghost, because I was about to start naming names. <laughs> I mean, you live walking distance from here. You, you got to pass here to get home. Key African American church in your community, I dare, I dare you just pass by and I come in and talk to us about the issues that's happening in our community. Let me move on. That's, that's what they did back then. They interceded. They sat down and collaborated. Here it is. Number three. We have to address. Address some things. We got to talk about some things. Such as, hot topic, race in America. We got to be willing to have that conversation. And not just in the barbershop. Black men must sit down with white men, and white men must sit down with black men, and vice versa with gender, gender, so that we can begin to understand one another. Every black man is not out to hurt you. But the assumption can be that. I mean, just, you just assume. You assume every black man is a thug and, and comes from a dark background. No, contrary. No, I'm educated. Two bachelors, three masters, and a doctorate degree. And I wear, wear Chuck Taylors. You can't just look at me and assume you know me. Because then you profiled me. Got to be willing to sit down. Here, here's the last one. Here's the last one. We have to be willing to advocate. Got to advocate for uniform police standards trainings and non-biased policing where it's not you always pulling over black people and you're always checking a certain demographic and then furthermore and when you overstep the lines of the law just as a reg regular citizen must be addressed your badge does not hide you or protect you from having to be charged, and if the case is appropriate, indicted. I close now with this last observation. Any preaching that is worth its salt must leave and end with hope. So at the end of the day, church, that's about all we got, hope. You just play softly, Doc. That'll help me finish, Derek. So what do we do? We recognize the sinful atrocities. We resist the spirit of apathy. We respond with strategic activities. But here it is, church. We must rely supremely in the authority. The authority I refer to It's not Trump, nor Clinton. Because if you let me have my commentary on that, 
Lord, help us. One has the audacity to present a platform and a position that if I'm president, I'll build a wall to isolate and segregate and debar a group from, here it is, a land that you stole. Ain't nobody wanna, ain't nobody wanna talk to me today. Ain't nobody wanna talk to me. Ain't nobody wanna talk. All of a sudden, you're going to act like you own it, and it was already occupied. And if you let me be your leader, I deport, deracinate people from a different religious community. You do understand if there's eth ethnic exclusivity against one, no one is off limits. <laughs> Vote for me, I protect you, I stand with you. I got history and heritage of being down with black people. Under your administration too, the incarceration rate of African Americans went up to an all time high. Oh, ain't nobody want to, ain't nobody, ain't nobody want to talk. Ain't nobody want to talk. So what do we do? We rely supremely in the Almighty. Now, let me, let me, go vote. Go vote. I mean, it, it is what it is. Go vote. Because I believe in that old uh, the song we used to sing in Greater Grand Central Mission Baptist Church. Ride on King Jesus. <laughs> no man, no party can hinder you. Because the heart of the king is in the hand of our God. He's the only one, old preacher would put it this way, he can, he's the only one that can take a twisted stick and still hit a straight line. You'll catch that round brunch. So Psalms 13 became my refuge, an oasis of hope. It's a psalm of lament. I'm going to read it for you. It says, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall... I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily. How long shall my enemies be exalted over me? Has anyone been asking that lately? Lord, how long? How long will we constantly witness and hear the crying of blood from our sons and daughters? How long will inequality and injustices continue to happen around us? How long? Here it is. Look at verse 3. Consider and hear me. Because even though I'm asking these questions, these interrogatives, I have not stopped interceding. Consider and hear me, O Lord. O my God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I prevail against them, and thou that troubles me rejoice when I am removed. Here's the shouting part. Whatever you study scripture, pay close attention to critical conjunctions. Because critical conjunctions, here it, are, here it is, are designed to shift the scene. Verse 1 and verse 2, you've been asking how long, how long, how long, how long. But here it is. There's now about to be a shift. But I will trust in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. In other words, here's what the psalmist is saying. Yes, it's dark days. Yes, it's difficult days. Yes, my heart is filled with anguish and anxiety. Yes, I'm grieving. Yes, I'm asking how long, but I've made this resolve that I'm not putting my trust in a man. I'm not putting my trust in a woman. I'm not putting my trust in an institution, but I'm putting my trust in you. And one day I'm going to rejoice because you're going to deliver us. You're going to save us. 
So I want us today to conclude old church. I just feel old church today. Old song we used to sing, hold on, just a little while longer. 